get started. My name is Ron DiSerrano. I'm the CEO of eSCADA. And today I want to walk you through how to build a live data monitoring application either on your own network or out on the internet. And we're going to be doing that using eSCADA's uh, status product line. And um, the demonstration is going to be made up of three parts. The first part is going to be a PowerPoint presentation on the system. And I know everybody hates PowerPoint, so I'm going to try and go through that as fast as possible. The second part of the demonstration, we're going to go into a sample application that was created using the system. And the third part of the demonstration, we're actually going to bring some live data into the software and show you how to get that data in front of your customers and your end users. So with that, let's get started. So Status is comprised of a couple of products. There's Status Enterprise, which will work behind the firewall or out on the internet. And there's also Status Device Cloud, which um, is a pure Windows Azure based uh, monitoring solution. Status Enterprise uses SQL Server or SQL Lite for its database, and Status Enterprise uses um, Azure Storage as its database. The client applications for Status, there's about a dozen of them. All of those client applications work with either version of the Status Server, and those client applications don't know if they, were, they are talking to Status Enterprise that's running uh, behind your firewall or if it's running, uh, if those client applications are running against Status Enterprise running out on the internet. And our system uses OPC UA through and through. OPC UA is a secure communication standard developed by the OPC Foundation. And the OPC Foundation is uh, a consortium of dozens and dozens of different companies, including Microsoft and, and all your Fortune 500s. So there's many, many, many companies out there that use OPC UA. Um, in their communications between um, applications with live data. So one of the things that OPC UA brings in addition to live data is it also has the ability of creating a data model. Now I've been in uh, SCADA systems for, for more than 20 years and one thing that I've seen that's, that's starting to come about is your better quality and your more intelligent systems will use a data model. If you are offered a, a software solution where the client applications are binding directly to sensor data, run. You do not want to be uh, having a system like that. There are better systems out there that use a model. Models to make things more organized. You can build a much richer and much more intelligent solution with a model. And you can have much uh, fewer configuration errors when you're trying to put a model together as well. So what happens with a model is the data comes into the model the client applications talk to the model, and all of the complexity of, of getting the data into the system is uh, abstracted away from all of your client applications. So what this allows you to do is it creates um, a much more organized system and a system that can be put together a lot faster. If you have your data model built, your client applications can st already start being built against that model, even if your live data hasn't been brought into the system yet. Older style systems, you had to get all of your live data set up before you could even start thinking about your client applications. When you have a data model in place, you don't need to do that. So all of the Status Enterprise client applications talk to the model directly. None of those client applications know anything about sensors or Modbus addresses or PLC addressing or anything like that at all. So that data model shows up in all of the client applications. So here we have um, what we call the data model designer, and this is where we actually build the model. And building a model is very simple. You just define a type, like maybe a pump. Then you'll add a couple of properties to that type, uh, building up a description of the, the assets that are important to you, the assets that you're monitoring, and then you create instances of those assets. And those are the real world um, things that, that are out that, that you're monitoring that you care about. And that data model is stored uh, into your status server, whether it's the one in the cloud or um, the one behind your firewall. So let's talk about how we build uh, front ends to these applications. 
one thing we've learned over the last decade here at Buscada is that there are two different kind of users. The first kind of user wants to have a point-and-click interface, very simple to use, wants results quick, and doesn't want to see any programming or any code. So we have a mimic design application for them. And then we have power users that want to what, that want to be able to do anything they actually want on the client side um, and extend that and customize it in any way they see fit. And they want code. Um, and we also have a, uh, our application designer for that group. So this is the Mimic Designer. In the toolbox here, we have hundreds of different types of controls that we've developed over the last several years. So you can just drag these controls out on the design surface. You pick a property in your data model, and you hit Publish and you have live data. It's that simple. Anybody can do this. Anybody can make fantastic looking front ends to their live data without having to uh, write a single line of code. And once you hit publish in our system, those screens can be viewed in either a Windows Thick client or on any HTML5 uh, enabled device. So we know with HTML5 that um, those screens will open on iPhones, they'll open on iPads, Blackberries and browsers on uh, all your major desktops. Beware of companies that only have client applications that r run Java, for example. It's not as portable. You're not going to be able to run those uh, client applications on as many devices as you can with HTML5. And these screens are not static. It's not a static snapshot of your screens. These screens update in real time. And if you have controls on these screens that go back to the model, you can actually uh, change values in the model, which will then go back out to your equipment. So you can actually do control um, from these screens as well if you want to. So this is the application designer for your power users. The graphics side, um, it is the mimic designer, exactly. Um, but in addition, you can do code behind in C Sharp or Visual Basic uh, to extend the application and build it out however you would like to do it. Now, one thing with the data model that starts becoming interesting is it's not just a value that's updating. You can start creating more intelligent applications. So we talked about how we create types, like a pump type in our model. I can go into my model and I can create a new type that is an incident report. And I can give that incident report a name, a priority, uh, a description. And using the Mimic Designer, I can create a data input form and I can create instances of that incident report and attach them to my equipment and start uh, capturing information uh, that's input manually by my operators. So you can build up a much more sophisticated and intelligent solution uh, once you have that data modeling in place. It might be an incident report, could be an inspection, whatever is important to you, you can build and design in, in the system. The Mimic Designer is also used for reports. So a report can be populated with live data. It can be populated with history, what's happened in the last eight hours or the last 24 hours. And that mimic will get saved as a PDF format. And it can be um, sent out through email. Um, that report can be generated from a button click on a design surface. You can set up a schedule in our system and have a report generated once a day and emailed to someone automatically. Uh, or you can even use workflow within our software to, to get a report uh, generated. We have a very, very powerful trend control that we've been working on for, for many years now. Uh, this trend supports multiple pens. You can add pens to a trend at runtime. It will show live or historical data. You can drop scrub lines. You can add, export the points in that trend to a CSV file. You can capture that trend um, in, a, in an image and use it in a report if you need to. Very, very, very powerful. The system also has alarms and notifications. So you can take a property on your model and you can set up an alarm. And if that, uh, the values on that property in the model go with the, out of range, an alarm will get generated. And you can have that alarm show up in your mimics using the alarm control. Or you can have that alarm emailed or text message to somebody and notify them that there's a problem that they need to take care of. We also have workflow in the system. So what happens is, let's say a value changes on a sensor or, or a, 
uh, Modbus address and it updates the model, we can have that property change trigger workflow to start. And that workflow can do a number of different things. It can set other property values in the model. It can send email messages. It can make web service calls. It can start other pieces of software. It can create new assets in the model, like a work order, for example. Or it can generate a report and have a report um, emailed off to somebody as well. We also have a calculation server in the system that we use for analytics. So we have a number of pre-canned calculations in this system. And you can also write your own. And you just need a little bit of .NET code to do that, to build up your own uh, calculations. And the way calculations work is you could, for example, create a type that has four properties. And you could use three of those properties as input into your calculation and have the output of your calculation go into the fourth property. Now that fourth property uh, can be used in the system like any other property. So you can use it in alarming or mimics or trending workflow reports, all of those different types of things. So you can go in and build very sophisticated analytics type uh, equations and uh, be able to have those executed um, within the system as well and, and, and customize it just the way you want it. So another thing that we've been working on, and we've started introducing this into the system very, very slowly. It's here. Uh, it's in the system now. Uh, it's optional if you feel like using it or not. It's up to you. And what it is is some very basic maintenance management. So a piece of equipment in our system has a collection of uh, work requests. And um, so these are work orders that can be associated with a piece of equipment. And you can create job lists for different users. Um, like I said, the, the functionality right now is very basic, and we're waiting for our customers to give us recommendations on how to expand this into the system. But where we're moving is uh, we're trying to, and, and we've already got there to some extent, is that we can do things now like if the vibration of a motor goes over a certain threshold, we would like to have a new work order generated and assigned to somebody automatically. And, and we can do those types of things in the system now. So that data model that we have running in the status server is, once it's got live information flowing into it, it becomes very, very valuable and very powerful. And quite often, people will want to build additional applications against that model. Instead of using you know, just the client uh, side products that, that BSCADA has, they want to build their own uh, software that, that works with the model and connects to the model. And we have a <coughs> two or three different ways that you can do that to connect to the model. Um, if you're familiar with OPC UA, you can use an OPC UA um, libraries to connect to the model. Or BSCADA has written a .NET object model over top of OPC UA. So with just five or six lines of .NET code, uh, you can connect to the model. You can start walking through assets. You can get property values. You can set property values. You can subscribe to uh, properties as their values change. You can create new assets. You can even generate um, new types um, programmatically uh, into the model. And you can also use REST. You can use REST to uh, get or set values within your data model. So right now, the system has connectivity to a number of different things. We have connectivity to uh, BSCADA sensors and sensors from Lebelium and Advantech. Uh, we have Modbus support, MQTT, SNMP, um, native drivers for Allen Bradley and Siemens. And, and we have a web services driver in development. Um, we are looking at building a BACnet driver in the near future as well. And quite often, we will have customers that, once they start using the system, realize that they can pull um, all kinds of live information into this. And they will ask us to develop a data connector for them that will bring live data from their specialty applications into the, so into the system. And we are happy to write that uh, for you. We have a number of software developers on staff that will, will build that uh, for you. And they can be done quite quickly. Sometimes in as, as fast as uh, you know several hours, we can write a data connector if it's a fairly simple one. If you have your own .NET developers, we'd be perfectly happy to give you the source code for a data connector so you can build your own connector to your own data with your own staff. So 
the PowerPoint is pretty much done. Um, this is just a sample of some uh, screens that have been built with the system. And the next uh, thing we're going to do is I'm going to run a demonstration application now and show you a little bit of what the software can do. And I'm going to start that right now. So when you install the system, you end up with this application launcher. And these uh, half dozen are the most common applications that you'll use with the system. Uh, this is a, the Windows runtime, and I'm just going to connect to uh, the sample project. And we call this Virtualville. Now, this project uh, has been built by uh, interns and students that have come into, this, into the company. So what we do is we let them loose on this project, and we have them build onto it. So each of these sections was done by a different individual. And uh, so I've got a few different things I can navigate down into here. So I'm going to go down into the substation. And I can see that I've got some live data. I've got a trend here that's updating. I've got a current load that's updating. Um, I can see down here I've got a, a scroll control that's updating with some real, real data. Um, I can drill down into this distribution bus. And I can see I have various gauges and charts that are updating in real time. If I look closely, these bubble charts are even updating and migrating around on the screen. So I can click one of these bubbles, and I can drill down into it. And I can get more information on, uh, on that particular distribution bus. I can drop a scrub line here on my trend. Uh, I have another trend up here. And here is uh, here's an interesting use of calculation. So uh, this is overall equipment efficiency. And what's happening is these three values are being used in a calculation to generate the fourth value. So that's an ex excellent example of how calculation can be used within the software. I can click this button here and generate a report on this distribution bus. Um, I can go back. Um, I have some alarms. So I can click on the alarm button, and that'll take me to another screen where I can see uh, some alarms that I have running in the system. I can acknowledge these alarms. I can add notes to them. And those alarms get saved into history within the system as well. Going back to the main menu, we'll take a quick look at some of these other ones. So here's a, um, a water treatment sample. This one here is a, a wind farm example. Now, the important thing to remember about this entire solution is this entire solution was written without any programming by students that are not programmers or not web developers at all. They did this with um, the applications that are, are part of Status Enterprise. So this application is for energy management. Uh, again, I've got an alarm indicator blinking here, so that means there should be alarms in the system. I can go in and take a look at those. Um, I can view my HVAC unit, and I can drill down and see my air handling unit. And again, beautiful, beautiful graphics, beautiful front end, no programming. So how do we do this? How do we actually get this type of, of application built without having to write a line of code at all? So that's the next thing that we're going to, uh, that we're going to show you. So. Um, I'm going to shut this application down. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to set the system back to its state right after you install. Now, the installation for Status Enterprise is a typical Windows installation. It's an executable. You run it. You can install it on Windows 7, 8, Windows 10, Windows Server. It'll install in about three minutes. And when you do the install, it's going to ask you what database type you would like. You can select SQL Server, and you can use SQL Server or SQL Express. But there is some configuration involved in, in using that database, a little bit that needs to be set up. Um, the other option is SQLite. And there's nothing that has to be set up with SQLite. So I would recommend, if you're evaluating the system, choose SQLite initially. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm, I'm shutting down uh, the status server. So I've just done that. And I'm going to um, find the database for uh, the software. And I found that. 
and I've deleted the database and now I've restarted the server. So now the system is back exactly the way it is after you run an install. And what we're going to do is we're going to pop in, create a little bit of a model, add some live data, and uh, build a front end for our customers. And we're going to do that in just a few minutes. So the first thing with a new install is, is you need to define what it is that you are interested in, what you care about, and what you want to monitor. So this is the data model designer. This is where we build the model. And we have some basic types already uh, defined in the system for you. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to the equipment type. And we're going to create a new subtype. I'm going to call this one a pump. And on that pump, I can add properties. So we have a number of different property types. Um, I'm going to select a measurement. It's a double. And I'm going to create a flow rate property on that pump. And I'm going to create another property too, uh, maybe RPM. And the third property I'm going to create, I'm going to just call this one sum. And the reason for that is we're going to use a, show how we use a calculation with that property. So I created a pump type. And I can, if I would like data logging to happen on this flow rate property, all I need to do is hit that checkbox right there. And as the values change on that flow rate, that value would get logged into the system. If I would like to create an alarm for flow rate, I can select my alarm type and create a new alarm. I can set the threshold values. I can set the messages. I can set this alarm up to be text messaged or emailed um, if this alarm comes, uh, comes active. And I can also create a condition for this flow rate. So I could say, for example, if the value goes over 1,000, then um, this condition will become true. And we can use this condition with workflow. Um, calculations. Let's see how we use a calculation. So we have a .NET assembly with different uh, methods in it. And again, you can create your own .NET calculations and use it in our system. So I've selected a, uh, a calculation uh, just called add. And um, I want the input for add to be my flow rate, the flow rate property that I created, and also the RPM property that I created. There we go. And I would like the output of that calculation to go into sum. So what will happen now within the software is, is, is either the flow rate or the RPM value changes. That calculation is going to get executed. And the result of that calculation is going to go back into the sum property. So I've got some basic properties set up. I have an alarm, a condition, a calculation. And there's something else that we can do with types. So I'm going to add another subtype, only this time I'm going to call it an HVAC unit. And I can make much more complex types than, than just the pump. So I can go to the HVAC unit and go to components. And I can say, OK, you know my HVAC unit? It is made up of different parts. And one of those parts is a compressor, which is a pump. So now my HVAC unit is built up of more sophisticated parts. And you can build a multi-level uh, assets that are very, very sophisticated if you want within the system. So um, I've got properties here. And I can see with pump, too, that I, I, I have properties on equipment. And when I created my pump, uh, my pump inherited all of the properties from equipment. So there's inheritance in this type structure as well. So once you've got your types created, then you create instances of the types. And these are the real world assets that you are interested in monitoring. So I'm going to create two pumps. I'm going to create pump A1 and pump A2. So there's pump A1 created, and here's pump. Oh, I don't want to create a piece of equipment. I want to create a pump, or pump A2. So now I've got two assets in my system. And I defined what these assets are. They're the pump. And if I look at these assets that got created, 
If I look at the flow rate, for example, I can see I've got my alarm, I've got my condition, all the default values that I set are kept. My calculation has been uh, created automatically. So all of the settings and things that I defined in my type are now picked up as I create instances of my assets. And if you are monitoring a large number of similar assets, this has just saved you hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of time. Okay, so we've got our type system defined. We've got our assets defined. Let's bring some live data into the system. And we do that through data mapping. So we create a new data mapping configuration. I'll just call this one test. And we need to pick some live data to bring into the system. So on this data provider uh, drop list, I can select an OPC server. I can select an Allen Bradley PLC. I can select a Modbus unit. Um, I can select different sensor companies to bring data in from. Um, just to keep this similar or simple, we have a data simulator provider, so I'm going to use that one to keep things nice and simple. And what we do next is we configure data mappings. And what a data mapping is, is it maps a property in your model to a live property uh, from your equipment. So if I go through my assets, go to pump A1, I can see I've got my flow rate property and my RPM property. And I want to map that to a piece of live data. So these are the live values that I can map that to. If this is a, if I had chosen sensors, I could be mapping to, you know, a temperature sensors, temperature property, or humidity. So I pick the property that I'm interested in um, monitoring, and I can right-click almost anywhere and collect add mapping. So now this property in the model, the RPM value on pump A1, is now mapped to this piece of live data. And I can do that as well with the flow rate. And I can go to pump A2, and I can pick the RPM value and map that. And I can pick the flow rate value and map that. So now I've got mappings to four properties on two different assets within my model. And I can close this, and I'll give it a quick little save. And I'm going to pull up another part of the system now. So this is the data model browser. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to walk through anything in our model and pick an asset and say that we would like to see the information on that asset. So I've just pulled up um, some the live data monitoring for pump A1 and pump A2. And I can see now that I've got um, live data flowing into the model. I can also see that my calculation is working. My sum is updating as the RPM and the flow rate update. So I can walk through my entire model and I can pick any property that I want and I can pull up live information on it. If I want to uh, write back to the model, I can do that from this, this application as well. If I'm interested in a trend, I can pull up any property on any asset and with a click of a mouse I can bring up a live trend on that property. If I would like to add another property to this trend, I can do that. I can click the Add button and pick the property out of my model that I would like to add. Uh, to the trend. I can uh, get alarming information. So I can go to alarms and I can pull up the uh, alarming tab. So I see I've got a couple of alarms that were generated on the flow rate property that we created on those two pumps. The values have gone outside of the range of those alarms. So those alarms are there, they're active. Um, I can also go to history and I can pull up any property on any asset um, flow rate, for example, and I can look at all of the data values that have been changing while you and I have been talking. So there's all the data values that are currently in that, that flow rate. And I can export these points to, to a CSV file if I want to you know, go off to an Excel and play with them and do those types of things. I can take this trend, I can export this point set of this trend, I can save this trend as a graphic that I can email off to somebody. So we've got a lot of information going on here already um, with the system once we have live data into it. Now, you can provide this application to your end users if you wish, but most people like designing their own front ends to the system. And we do that with our Mimic Designer. Now, the Mimic Designer is uh, the application, that, that sample application that we were looking at, 
this is the application that was used to build all of that. Um, so what we do is we create a new mimic. Now I'll just call this test, make it simple. And we save these mimics into the model. So there's a folder here called shared mimics. I'm going to save it into there. And now I can go into my toolbox and I can grab some different controls and pull them out onto the design surface. I got a radial, a simple gauge, a radial gauge, a racing gauge. And maybe I want to pull out something different, a different like LED, for example. So all of these, and there's dozens and dozens of different kinds of controls in here. There's 2D controls, there's 3D controls, there's um, you know, battery controls and ratings controls and maps and charts and you name it, it's in here. Um, and all of these controls can be customized. So if I go to the properties, there are dozens of properties that I can change on every single control to make it look exactly the way I want it to look. So this is an LED. Maybe I don't like the color of that's you know inside of that. I can change that. Now I've got a, the different color. So the next step for us is we want to bring live data into these uh, these controls. So again, I'm working with my model here. I go to pump A1, and I pick my flow rate, and I can bind that flow rate to that graphic. I can bind the RPMs to this one. I can go to my uh, second pump, and I can bind uh, the flow rate to that one, and I can bind the RPMs to this one. So now I've got four properties for my two pumps mapped into those graphics. So that's simple. Now all I need to do is just hit publish, and boom, I've got live data. And I can put my own company logo on this screen and customize it and make it just for me. So I'm going to push this uh, example a little bit further. I'm going to create another mimic, and I'm going to call this mimic uh, test2. And we'll go to the toolbox, and we'll throw out a couple of controls here. So there's a battery. Here's a thermometer, signal strength control, lots of different stuff. And there's also another section for navigation. So there is a navigate back button. So I'll put that in the design service. This is our back button. And I'm going to save this graphic as well. I'm going to save it also into shared dynamics. And go back to our test screen. And I'm going to grab a navigation button. And tell that navigation button that I would like it to navigate when I click it, I would like it to go to the other screen. And I can hit publish. And now I have my live data. And I've even got navigation between different screens happening now within the system. So we are running this right now in a Windows Thick client. Now remember, with the Mimic Designer, all of these screens can also be viewed in um, HTML5. So if we launch our browser and we log into the system through our web gateway, we can go to our shared mimics folder and we can pull up our test mimic and it is running now in pure HTML5 through a web browser. And if we have a mobile device, we can run these screens on mobile devices. All of the navigation works just like that. If I go back to my model browser and I refresh the model, I can go into Shared Mimics and I can bring up that mimic inside of the model browser as well and work with it. Very, very powerful. So there's one thing I'd like to point out in the, uh, the mimic designer. I'll close these screens down. Now, when we create a mimic, we have chosen regular mimic, which is this button here, uh, but we can also create a mimic template. And what a mimic template is, is we create a mimic for a type of thing, not for a specific thing. So I can create a single mimic for a pump type. And if I have 500 pumps in my system, I can use that one mimic with every single one of those pumps. I don't have to create multiple graphics for, for each of those pumps. So this can save huge, huge amounts of time. Um, 
and I could probably spend an hour in uh, in this graphics designer. Um, we have all different sorts of, of you know there's grouping in here there's layering there is a tree here that shows all of your different assets there is um, all different kinds of clip art in here as well that we can pull out onto the design surface we can take some graphics that we create and save them into um, these folders so that we can reuse them later there is, uh, you know, complex curves and, and, you know, all sorts of different types of stuff that we can do. Um, the, you know, there's layering. You can bring things forward. You can bring things backward. Um, there's skewing. You can bind to any property. Any property <coughs> on a control can be bound to a property in the model. Um, very, very, very powerful. Okay, so we've... Um, we created a model. We brought live data into the model. We generated our own front end for our applications. Um, let's go back to the data model designer. And in the last two or three minutes before I finish, I want to talk about some of these other tabs very, very quickly. Discrete item text. If you want to put a label on your mimic and you do not want it to show true or false, but you want it to show, it to show something else, you can do that. For example, open or closed, yes or no, on or off. You can do that. You can define your own engineering units and attach them to properties. Because these are just some basic uh, things with properties. There's more advanced things that properties can have on them. Um, so an engineering unit is one of those advanced things. You can define enumerations. So you can have a combo box on the design surface. And that combo box can have a pick list that you define uh, using enumerations, like high, medium, or low, for example. Logging, you can define a more complex um, logging configuration. By default, all we have to do is just hit that checkbox for historizing and we get uh, logging. But if you would like more control over your data logging, maybe you don't want your database to fill up so fast and you only want to log values every five minutes instead of on every value change, you can do that. Messaging is for setting up uh, email notifications like with alarms, for example. Security, um, there's users and roles. And users are created in our Assets tab. So we go to the users and we say create a new asset. And I can create a new run user. Authentication can be regular username or password. Windows authentication, LDAP, or X509 certificates can be used for authentication. And once a user is created, there's other things that you can set on this user. For example, you can specify what screen that user will be taken to when they log into the system. It's, it's one thing that you can do. Workspaces. Workspaces works along with your users. So you can create a workspace. And here we have an administrator's workspace. And I can add a, a role to workspaces or an individual user. And what workspaces allows me to do is it gives me more control over my model. So I can take anything on my model, a type, a property, or even a particular asset, and I can specify that it belongs to a workspace. Now what happens is, if I'm in any of my client applications, like the model browser, for example, if I am not a member of that workspace, I will not see that property in the model. That property will not show up for me. So I can start hiding and showing different properties for different groups of users within the data model. And those workspaces also apply to the mimics, the uh, mimic designer as well. If I go to my navigation button, for example, I can say that that navigation button belongs to the administrator's workspace. And if I log into the screen and I am not an administrator, I will not see that button. Maybe that button navigates to something important, like the system configuration, for example. Um, I can choose who gets to see what graphics on what mimics um, using my workspaces. Um, we've already talked about data mapping, how we map our live data to properties in our model. And the last tab here is uh, workflow. So what we do in workflow is there are different 
types of tasks that we can execute. We can uh, set values on different properties in the model with workflow. We can send email messages. We can generate a report. We can start external programs or make web service calls to other pieces of software within our, within our, our company. Or we can even create new assets. And workflows get executed by conditions becoming true. So we select the conditions that we would like um, to be used to execute this workflow. And we remember when we went back to types when we first started that we created a condition on our flow rate. So we can, if we wish, use this condition going over a value of 1,000 as the trigger to start this particular workflow to execute. Okay, so um, we are pretty much finished now. I am going to take 30 seconds and do something with this gauge really quick. So I'm going to copy and paste this gauge. I'm going to rotate this gauge by 180 degrees. I'm going to squash it a little bit. Maybe I would like to uh, skew it. And there's a property called flow direction that I'm going to tweak. And I'm also going to change the opacity of this guy. So now I've got a nice reflection effect of um, that gauge. And I would like to see any other HMI, SCADA, or IoT platform type product that could do graphics this powerful and that easy. So I'm going to publish this. And I'm going to see that um, that reflection is also updating in real time, just like its uh, parent control. Very, very awesome. All right, so I am pretty much finished now. I've shown you uh, how we can bring live data into a system, how we can get that live data viewed to our customers, how we can save the history of it, how we can trend it, how we can use it in workflow and reporting. And we can do this either with um, status um, enterprise, which will run behind the Windows uh, firewall. It'll run on Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10, Windows Server, with a very simple Windows installation in about three minutes. And that will also run out in the internet. If you want to get a hosted computer, like at a company like you know, one in one, for example, or even um, you know, commandeer a, a computer in Windows Azure, uh, Windows Server. Uh, in, in Windows Azure, you can do that, and you can install Status Enterprise there and use it out on the internet. If you're looking for something much, much more powerful and, and much larger of an installation, we have Status uh, Device Cloud, which is running completely in Windows Azure using Azure Storage. And for your very, very large smart city and 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 much, much, much larger deployments. Um, you can use that application. So um, what I would usually do at this point, if I had your email address, is I would um, send you a getting started guide. And that getting started guide will have a download link to the system. And it will give you the installation to Status Enterprise. And it would be a six-month trial of the entire system. Um, that getting started guide also provides you with the, uh, the literature on the software. So um, the documentation, we have tried to do an outstanding job on the documentation for you. So the user guide is broken up into 14 parts, and, and they are very well written. This is part five, for example. This is uh, just the controls in the toolbox of the Mimic Designer. And every single control is here. Um, you know, what properties are important on that control, how to use those controls and get the most out of them. So like I said, the documentation is excellent. If you need any help with anything, email. We're always here to give you a hand. Um, that getting started guide will also give you the links to training videos. So we have a number of training videos that we've done on the system. How do I uh, configure a trend? How do I configure an alarming control? So these are all short five, six minute videos that will show you step by step walking you through how to set those up and answer your questions. I hope that you've enjoyed my presentation. Again, my name is Ron DiSereno, CEO of BSCADA. If you would like to email me, my easy email address is ron at b-scada.com.
and I would be happy to uh, answer any more of your questions or arrange a, a personal webinar for you. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope you have uh, an excellent rest of the day. And BSCADA looks forward to hearing from you soon.